I want to talk about the idea of basis vectors. And as a context for that, consider the classic block on an incline, where there's a force of gravity straight down, a normal force perpendicular to the incline, and a frictional force, say, up the incline. And what I want to do is I want to look at the components of the forces in a normal coordinate system you might want to draw with x and y. Uh, and actually, let's just look at the components of the gravitational force. So in my xy coordinate system, I would write that the gravitational force fg is minus mg in the j hat direction. So it's down in the negative j hat direction. But you could also choose another coordinate system, an x prime y prime coordinate system that's tilted at angle theta with respect to the xy. So in the x prime y prime coordinate system, the force of gravity has to be broken up into a component that's perpendicular and parallel to the incline. And once we figure out those components, we'd find that it's minus mg sine theta in the i hat direction and minus mg cosine theta in the j hat direction, or the new i hat and j hat directions. This is, of course, the same force. We're just writing it in different coordinate systems. OK, so the point here is that I can use two different bases. In particular, I can use the i hat j hat set of unit vectors, and that is a basis. What I mean by that is that any vector v could be written in terms of this basis. So I could write any vector v as, say, some coefficient times i hat plus some other coefficient times j hat, where a and b are some constants that I could figure out. Well, but i hat prime and j hat prime are also a basis. It's also an acceptable way to write a vector. So I could write any vector v as a combination of the i hat prime and j hat prime unit vectors. So I could write this c i hat prime plus d j hat prime, where again, c and d are some numbers that I could try and figure out in this new coordinate system. In general, a basis for me is going to be uh, any vector or be defined as any vector can be written as a combination of the basis vectors. So if I have a set of vectors that I want to know if it's a basis or not, then this is going to be my criterion. Any vector can be written as a combination of those vectors. Uh, so we've already seen two examples of those, the i hat, j hat, and i hat prime, j hat prime. Um, but just as an aside, note that basis vectors don't actually need to be unit vectors, although sometimes it's useful if they are. So consider the vectors, say, alpha, which is i hat plus 3j hat, and beta, which is just 2i hat. So if I were to draw these vectors out on my normal xy plane, alpha would go like this, and beta would look like this. So can we use alpha and beta as a basis vector or base set of basis vectors? Yes, they certainly can be. So in particular, my test is, can I write a vector, any random vector, in terms of alpha and beta? So if I let v be i hat plus j hat, can I write this in terms of alpha and beta? Sure, why not? In fact, here is a combination, so one-third alpha plus one-third beta, in term, turns out, does this. Let's just check that. So one-third alpha is i hat plus three j hat, and beta is two i hat. So I combine this all together, I get i hat plus j hat. Yep, so this is a way of writing v in terms of the alpha and beta basis. So note in this case that alpha and beta aren't even perpendicular. So if I take the dot product between these two, then that's writing alpha and beta out, I get two. So basis vectors don't have to be unit vectors. They don't even have to be perpendicular. So we have some special names for the ones that are. So an orthogonal basis is a basis set of basis vectors, which are all mutually perpendicular to each other. In contrast, then, an orthonormal basis 
will be a basis where not only are all basis vectors perpendicular, so they're perpendicular to each other, not only are they perpendicular, but they also have unit length. So the usual i hat j hat basis is orthonormal because of that. But I don't have to choose those. It doesn't have to have those properties. So in general, in two dimensions, any two non-parallel vectors can form a basis, alpha and beta in the example that we had before. So that's for 2D. If you have in n dimensions, then you need n non-parallel vectors, again, for n dimensions. So for three dimensions, you need three non-parallel vectors to make a basis. Let's talk a little bit about how I convert from one basis to another basis. I'm converting between bases. Again, let's talk about this alpha that I had before and beta. And let me consider a vector A, which is 10 alpha minus 7 beta. And I want to convert this to the i hat, j hat basis. Well, I want to present two ways of thinking about this. So the first way is I just say, well, it's got to be some I, a i hat plus some b j hat. What are those? Well, 10 times alpha, written as i hat and j hat, minus 7 times beta, as written as i hat j hat. So I multiply that out, and it looks like a must be minus 4, and b is 30, if I were to write a in i hat j hat. But I also want to investigate this in matrix form. So let me write this a, b, the coefficients I want to know, as the i hat, j hat, as a column vector. And then there's a matrix which transforms from one basis, the i hat, j hat, and the alpha and beta bases. And I know what the components are in the alpha and beta basis, and the matrix will help me transform from one to the other. So I just need to multiply this column vector times the matrix, and I get minus 4, 30, which then also tells me the same thing that I knew before, which is my i hat component is minus 4, and my j hat is 30. The reason I wanted to do this is because it turns out, in general, matrices are quite useful for converting bases. And ultimately, that's what's going on. We have these linear equations, which are allowing us to convert from one basis to the other. And so matrices are what's really going on behind the scenes. So let's consider another one. B is 4i hat plus 3j hat. What is B in the alpha and beta basis? It's going to go backwards, the opposite of what we just did. Well, again, we can do this in two ways. Let me first start with the matrix form. So I know what the matrix or what I need in terms of the i hat, j hat basis. I have this transformation matrix, which transforms uh, from alpha and beta bases to i hat and j hat. And I don't know the alpha and beta components of this column vector. That's what I'm after. So I could write this as the vector b is equal to mx, where m is matrix. If I want to solve for the, the vector x, I can just multiply by the inverse on the left of each side. So x is m inverse b, where m inverse is the inverse of this matrix m, and we can compute that, and it turns out we get this matrix right here. So then we multiply out the left-hand side, m inverse here, times the vector v, b, which is 4, 3, and I multiply that out. And I find that x, the vector that I'm interested in, is 1, 3 halves. Well, that tells me that, again, from this vector that I had above, a is 1, b is 3 halves. So my new vector, or my vector b written in these new bases, is alpha plus 3 halves beta. Of course, I could do this a different way. I could write out, I've got my vector in i hat, j hat form, and I want to write that in some way some coefficient times alpha time plus some coefficient times beta. And I need to figure out what a and b are. So I can collect terms, so all the terms that have an i hat and all the terms that have a j hat. And then I have two equations to solve. Match the coefficients of the i hat, match the coefficients of the j hat. And that ultimately tells me the same thing, solving these two equations for the two unknowns. 
So it gives me the same result, um, but the matrix form is in some sense a little bit more fundamental and will be useful a little bit more broadly. Okay.